Hi there, I'm Josh Finn from J&H Aerospace, and today we're going to talk about trimming Science Olympiad flight airplanes. So we're going to, this one is for the senior flyer. We'll do another video for the uh, Stinger, all of the principles remain the same. So I've been getting a lot of questions, videos from people who can't get the planes to fly, uh, and I've tried to clarify the instructions and whatnot, but we keep having some of the same uh, problems. So I'm going to work on seeing if we can address those specific problems. So I've seen these issues uh, both in person, at contests, uh, and uh, via email. So we're going to go kind of step by step. So let's talk about the first thing. You need to have a flight box for each airplane. The rules require, and it's a stupid rule, but the rules require you to have one box for each airplane. Your airplanes should come to the contest in the box with the wing removed. Once you show up at the contest, put the wing on and whatnot. Make sure you have a box that complies with the rules. The banker boxes that are being promoted for Division B are not legal. They are too long. Uh, we have, my wife is behind the camera. She can tell you that uh, she measured a dozen. They're mainly of too wide, guys, because yeah. um, as I've seen with them, the they're, too, they're too long in particular, but oh, but it's also that this one is currently too long because it's squished out on me. But you could easily tape that shut to comply yeah. with the rules. Neither here nor there. The issue is you're gonna have to get a box that is custom for the task at hand. Um, I have several airplanes in this box and so on. I have multiple rubber motors in this box as well. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, don't store your rubber motors in your box. Uh, I have a travel procedure that dictates that that's okay for my stuff. However, in general, your box gets kicked up upside down by your teammates. Uh, all the rubber motors fall on top of stuff and start breaking things. No tools should be inside your box. You'll notice I never store tools in the box with my airplanes. That's the way that goes. Uh, next topic. And I'm going to take my the other thing I've seen, guys, is make sure that you, that when you come in check it, to check in, if you have to have some kind of checklist, you know, say I have, have to have a, checklist for all a box, stuff. a plane, my winder, my winding, you know, if you have a torque meter, your torque meter, your glue, yeah, because so that's the thing is torque your... Torque meter, uh, glue, accelerator, something to dip accelerator out, clay rubber lubricant of some sort which we're going to go over that in a minute and of course having a winder you cannot wind these airplanes by hand it this this is not it it's simply it's not possible under the current rules so uh and and so another thing to bring up is have a torque meter you need to have a torque meter you need to follow the instructions to make sure that it functions correctly and so on uh, this is an electronic torque meter. Uh, these are available from Indoor Free Flight Supply. They're much better. Uh, they are $110, but uh, when you consider overall cost of the event, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, if you don't have a torque meter on hand, in a pinch, you can hook a rubber motor to any metal hook by the O-ring and proceed onwards. Do not let me see you winding on the plane. I'm tired of that. It's not the correct way to wind these airplanes. Use a hook or something. That way you don't need someone helping you out on that process. If you do have a teammate, that teammate can be concentrating on things they actually need to be doing, like looking for obstacles, making sure your plane's not damaged, and so on, instead of holding your airplane and shielding it from exploding rubber motors, which you should have six rubber motors out ready to go when you go check in, and you should check in all of them. You are allowed to wipe the rubber lubricant off before uh, entering the motors. Now, before every flight, you're going to want to lubricate the rubber motor. This is silicon oil that we sell. Do not use Vaseline. Do not use WD-40. Do not use vegetable oil. If you're in a pinch, Armorall will work. And that this you guys is better. Molly Coat 33 is also an excellent option. This you can just get in any kind of tire shop, you know, any of your Walmart, Walmart, your any of those will have some kind of um, protectant, or you know, especially yeah. if it's for cars and 
you know, for your tires or for your dash, it, you know, will work for this stuff too. Next up, let's talk about an airplane. So this is a, a senior flyer. This is an early prototype. This would be Division B eligible because it's got a long wing. Um, I have it set up the way most people would have it, meaning several repairs to the tail uh, and to the tail boom, and the wing was cracked loose and glued on any which way and so on. Uh, we've got a little bit of a breeze blowing, but I'm going to show you the propeller has not been adjusted and the propeller is not balanced. So we can see this ends up stopping like that. That means that propeller is going to shake your airplane to death. If you say anything about your airplane is shaking in flight, it's Dutch rolling, no, it's probably that your propeller is not balanced. There is a way to balance a propeller. There is only one way effectively to balance it. Now we're outside, so this makes it a little bit challenging, but I'm gonna show you the way to do this. You can, we have a video on scraping propellers. You can watch that, uh, but in a pinch, uh, with limited time, this is the best way to do it. So the blade that stopped in the up position, you put a dab of glue on it, and you put a little bit of clay on here. Now I'm holding the wind at, the, at my back, so hopefully this will work out okay. And we can see it still stops in the same position. That means it's still not balanced. Again, we are using tiny little pieces of clay. Do not use big globs of clay and just assume it will work. This is a process that you have to, it is a trial and error process and you just keep going until it's right. Now the wind's blowing a different direction. All right, now I got lucky on this one. Because it's generally just staying. So that means that prop is balanced. Normally it would take you four or five iterations minimum to get this right. You to add and remove, remove tiny little slivers of clay until it's right. Now find a room that doesn't have a lot of drafts. Uh, if you can't, find a calm evening outside or something. Uh, if, if, you know, if the air conditioning's on, your airplanes are not gonna fly well, plain and simple. They will fly better outdoors, frankly, on a calm evening than they will inside, uh, e even in a light breeze. Um, so, next thing to look at, I have this tail on crooked, so you can see my tail's cocked up like that. My wing is set where it normally would look like you would want it to be. That's not where it should be. It should be way up here. And my wing is twisty. So we're going to show you the symptoms of that by winding this airplane up and letting you see what that looks like, which most of you have already seen this behavior. And then we're going to go piece by piece through how to fix each of these problems. Now, I am using an Orwee winder. These are available from IndoorFreeFlightSupply.com, Indoor FF Supply. They are a uh, little under $300. Um, you can use regular winders, and they are fine. Now, yeah, notice I have hooked by the O-ring. Only the O-ring is attached to those hooks. And sorry for the plane. I'm going to set this up here and lock my winder real quick. And we'll fix that little tidbit. Once we get this flying well, we're probably going to lose a plane today. By the way, I should mention, have a model stand for your airplane so it's not on the floor getting stepped on. Very important, and they're easy to make. All you need is some chunk of, of wood. I know this looks pretty, but some chunk of wood. Some chunk of wood here, and a piece of foam at the top to hold your plane does not have to be anything simple. Even a piece of styrofoam with a slot in it will work. All right, so I'm gonna crank in about 400 turns here. So I wind most of my turns stretched out. I'm gonna come in, I've got 411 turns. That's my digital readout. Obviously, you will have to hand count normally. Now, to load this airplane, Hold on, one thing I'll say, guys. Um, make sure you know what kind of winder you have. Yeah, know your ratio out here, because this number that's coming out here, that 400 turns coming out here, is what I need to know. If you so have if our red winders, those are 20 to 1. They they actually yeah. say that and on there. there. There are yellow 10 to 1s, there are yellow 15 to 1s. Know what that ratio is. Can you kind of explain them to them what, how to take the cranks to get the number of turns? Yeah, so what you would do is you would count the number of times that turns 
in one revolution of this hand crank. That's how you would do it. And so one revolution would be you would, you know, say I took I did forty revolutions around or cranks around, then you times that by twenty or ten or fifteen, whatever your winder is, um, to get your total turns. All right. Now, and what what would you be looking for an estimate for the plane for your, senior flyer? Do not expect your airplane to start climbing until you have at least eight hundred turns in this rubber motor. If you send me an email and tell me it's not climbing, and then I find out you're putting six hundred turns in there, I'm going to tell you what you already know now, which is or should know is the airplane is not going to climb unless you have a minimum of eight hundred turns. Um, if it's got an unbalanced prop and issues, uh, lots of repairs and whatnot, you're going to need a thousand turns to get it climbing well. All right, now I am holding this so that the propeller shaft is locked and pushed all the way back so this can't move. The reason is I need clear access to that hook. I grab right behind this O-ring and I slide it onto the prop shaft. I do the same thing back here. I grab it so that the O-ring is constrained, and if it looks like I'm squeezing the living daylights out of this piece of rubber, I am squeezing so hard that it would just about put your finger out of joint. All right, now the plane is wound. I'm going to tell you, this airplane is going to crash. All right, we've already discussed why. So when I let this go, it does that. All of you have seen this problem. So, let's correct the problems on this airplane one at a time. Excuse my chicken that's trying to take a ride in the car. Alright, now I have stuck a stick. Oh, I thought I was. I'll try again. I've stuck a stick through that O-ring. Now the stick adds a little bit of weight. But for sake of argument, I've got the rubber motor wound, ready, ready to go. I'm going to balance this airplane right here. You can see it's balanced up at the front of the wing. So, we want this airplane to balance back here. Now, this airplane doesn't balance as far back as, as some of them do. And I'll tell you the reason why... Um, is, like I said, this is an early prototype, so it's got a longer wing, so the CG does not need to be as far back. Now, we're balancing about, sorry, we got a breeze blowing through, so we're balancing right about there, so we'll slide the wing further forward yet. You can see how far forward I've got the wing. Most of you are going to end up with it right up against that post. Right, so we're balancing about there. We're going to try that for the time being. All right, so the, that addresses, is gonna start to help address the nosedive. But I, if you noticed, when we let this plane go, it was rolling off to the left as well. So I'm gonna demonstrate that one more time, just so you can see it. And we did break the front post loose, so we'll have to fix that in a minute. All right. The airplane's trying to go somewhat. Bonk. Into the house. All right, after every crash, check for damage. So wiggle this airplane around and see if things are wiggling, you know, bump at things. I can see, in this case, this wing post is riding up and down. So in this case, I want to put a dab of glue on here and fix it. After every flight, you should check for damage. Even, even routine flights, it is entirely possible your airplane could get damaged. Also, make sure you don't accidentally glue that wing mount in place because that can present its own set of problems. Now, what we saw on that flight, and I should mention... Since we're outside, we launched into an updraft. I could kind of feel warm air. And so the airplane's going up, but it's holding its nose down. So it's flying like this. So we want to get the nose up, but we also want to get that wing level. 
So the way we're going to get that wing level, we could crack loose back here, but what we're gonna do in this case is we're gonna crack this wing joint right here. And so what I'm doing is I'm raising this wing tip relative to its trailing edge by cracking it in here. So on the side that I want to raise, I crack that up. And now, since that's cracked up like that, I'm gonna to have to glue it. There is no substitute for doing this. If you need, if the airplane has this issue where the wing is twisted, this is the only way to fix it. Do not try to take a shortcut that doesn't involve breaking and re-gluing the wing. I see lots of people, I don't wanna break it. Well, then enjoy not having an airplane that flies. This is the way to do the process. Now, our rubber motor is mostly unwound, so we're gonna take it off. We always take it off of the back first. The reason for that is it is always easier to remove first from the fixed location than trying to fight the unfixed location while you're dealing with that back there, and you can break, oops, and you can break your fuselage in the process. So we're gonna again crank in 400 turns. And again, this, uh, this airplane, in spite of all that's been done to it, still flies, uh, is still built pretty lightly. So it's behaving better than your airplane probably will, and that's fine. Okay, so let's go over this way because I don't want to hit the house again. All right, so we're going to launch the airplane. And something else, do not chuck the airplane up at the sky when it's not flying correctly. Always launch it level, let go of the propeller first, and slide it into the air. So all I'm doing is letting it go. Now we can see the airplane is not dipping that left wing as much anymore, but it is diving out. So let's talk about that. All right, so to do this, we're going to remove the rubber motor from the airplane again, like I showed, remove from the back first. Stick it on here. Remove from the front, stick on here. This would allow you to unwind and count the number of turns remaining as well. Now, if the airplane is balanced in a known pretty good location and it's going nose down, that means that somehow through repairs or whatever, the uh, or improper assembly or so on, the tail is not at the correct angle relative to the wings. So if the wing is level, the tail needs to be angled down like this, a couple of degrees. So the way to fix that I may not be able to do it with this knife. I may have to, there we go. Nope. All right, we're gonna pause and come back in a second. Okay, so taking a sharp razor blade and being careful to not trim the top of your thumb off when this blade comes through. We're gonna pop the tail loose like that. Now this is a piece of 1 16th balsa, so we're gonna crack off little piece of this wood. This is called shimming. We put glue on top and on bottom. Insert that piece right in there. So we've now raised the trailing edge of the stab 1 16th inch. Oh, let me get it. Okay, we verify the glue has hardened. And now we're just gonna use the same remaining turns because all I wanna do is evaluate the effect that this has had. This is probably not enough.
Okay, so what we saw was the airplane was flying less nose down, but it's still somewhat nose low. So we're going to repeat this process. So in my case, I'm gonna cheat and I'm just gonna uh, get the soft area. I'm gonna cut the, uh, that shim in half to free it. I'm leaving that shim in place though, because what I need is more shim thickness. So we cut off another shim and we stick it in place. We tried to not glue ourselves to the aircraft in the process. There's 200 turns. We'll wind in the remaining 200 as we work our way in here. By the way, being able to lock your winder in place like this is um, highly recommended. Obviously, I have a very fancy setup here, and this is nice but having some sort of cradle that you can put your winder in and just have a rubber band to wrap across to hold the winder in place uh, and maybe lock the handle really simplifies this task. Okay, so we're going to go and we're gonna fly this one more time. So same launch procedure as before. We let go of the propeller and then slide the airplane into the air and away it goes. And on a journey of self-discovery. Okay, so if you notice in that, in that particular flight, this airplane is maintaining a nice nose-high attitude. We didn't get any altitude to speak of, and that's fine. We're only winding to 400 turns. This airplane is performing exceptionally. Normally, you wouldn't have even seen it being able to hold level. That's fine. What we did notice is the airplane made one circle and then took off, headed off to nowhere. So there are two problems with this airplane contributing to that. One is... I glued my tail on crooked, so the tail is tilted this way. The airplane tends to turn towards the high side of the tail, so this side is high. Now, since I have the reaction from my propeller torque pulling me to the left, the airplane's not so much turning to the right as it's just going straight after a while. The easy way to fix this is grab the wood right here and twist. If it cracks, you can put glue there and that's fine. But now, the high side is on this side, and so the airplane will probably cruise a little bit better. But we're going to make an additional adjustment, and that adjustment is we're going to bend this rudder. You can do this on any airplane, even if, and if you have wingtips or whatever, you can bend them. Uh, but I want to turn to the left, so I'm going to take the trailing edge, and I'm going to bend it towards the left side. So this deflects the air that way to the to the left, which pushes the tail to the right and pushes the nose to the left as we move about our center of gravity. So if I push back here, I pivot the airplane about its center of gravity, pushing the nose to the left. Now, this airplane will turn. It may turn too much and spiral in, and we will have to add additional wing warp to fix that, but we've at least solved the turning issue. Now, at this point, we've made a couple of flights and we should be re-lubricating the rubber every flight. I haven't been, but we are definitely going to do it now. Remember that these rubber motors are disposable. You should expect to break a lot of them. In competition, if you aren't breaking several every contest, you're not winding hard enough. 
This is why you order more of them. Ideally, you order a quarter pound box of 332nd rubber from FAI Model Supply. Even further, ideally, you find a rubber stripper, order one eighth inch rubber, and then you can strip down to your specific desired size of rubber to maximize the performance of your airplane. Now we're gonna wind up a little more this time. So there's 400 turns. We're stopping at 700. Now at this point, this rubber stops feeling quite as rubbery. It's feeling a little harder now. And that's an indicator that we're getting more torque built up in the rubber motor. With apologies for the input by my chickens, I'm not trying to brag about my untold wealth, but we do have eggs. Please don't rob us. They're not laying that many. They're still young. Okay. So we're going to do the same process as before. So now we've got a nice steady left hand turn. Airplane's not really climbing. We'll fix that by winding up more. Paul's trying to see your point. I noticed that. <laughs> Daddy, I caught my breath. All right, now, this rubber motor just landed in the sand. Um, that means one of two things would have to take place. Either, and by the way, I'm going to show, this is how you backwind a rubber motor to count uh, the number of turns remaining. Ideally, you would take this into, uh, on a paper towel and wipe it off and re-lubricate it. Otherwise, um, this motor can no longer be used for contest flying. My plane is doing its best to be destroyed. Okay, so what we saw there is that we broke the airplane. Now, this is the wingtips do need to be attached correctly uh, because they do contribute to the stability of the airplane, meaning this airplane will not fly without these wingtips. You must have them attached, period, full stop. You must have them attached. Now, if one of them is bent in a little bit like this, the plane will still fly fine. It will not fly as well, but it will fly. Now, what we did observe there is that the airplane was leaning over on that left wing. So as I predicted, we need to fix that. So we're gonna crack the wing tip right here to raise it a little bit and create, add some twist. And we're gonna crack it back here so that that twist is not transmitted back in, causing other things to move around. And that is going to, as you can see, the wing is twisted here. And so that's going to act as right aileron to roll us out of that tight left-hand turn. Now, we were not getting a whole lot of a climb at 800 turns. So we're going to wind a little harder Seven. this time. Sorry, 700 turns, which is to be expected. So now that's 600 turns. So I wind about 60, 55 to 60 percent of my turns at full stretch, like this. So three, three to four times the relaxed length of the of the rubber motor, and then I work my way in on the remaining turns. Now, if you don't have a model stand of this type you would want to have a ruler or something so you can kind of measure that stretch distance and where you're supposed to end up. Now the rubber motor is much harder to load at this point because it feels very hard, it's under much more tension, and so the airplane is much more poorly behaved. If you're flying outside, your airplane can get damaged even in relatively calm winds. 
So to most of you, this would feel calm. This is enough wind to damage this airplane. The wind is at my back. I have the airplane leaned up here so that the wing is pushed against me, shielding the horizontal stab. If there's any significant breeze outside at all, you should not bringing the, be bringing this airplane out unless it's in a box. It should not be exposed to the elements. Okay, so that thermal has blown through. We're going to launch into what is called a downdraft, so it's not going to fly too well. But we've got a thousand turns. It ought to do okay. This is where I mentioned my air picking is really bad and I just launched into a thermal and we may not get this plane back. But what we can observe is that the uh, that wing warp adjustment has fixed the behavior and the airplane is climbing very nicely. It's maintaining its turn. Very nice flight pattern in general. You will definitely have to zoom in on that one. All right, I go to retrieve my plane or attempt. Okay, so we didn't get that one back. This is where I mentioned you should have a retrieval pole of some sort to get your plane down. It uh, doesn't work when it's a 70 foot, foot tall tree, but that's a separate issue. Uh, that's also why you build more than one airplane. You should show up with at least two airplanes to every contest, preferably more because you will damage, lose, etc. airplanes. So I recommend a minimum of four personally. Now, We've demonstrated how to trim the airplane to fly it. We've demonstrated basic winding. I have not talked about torque on the torque meter, but we were going up to about 0.4 to 0.5 on the torque meter. Um, ideally, you would take a rubber motor, a small, short, little loop of rubber, stick it on here, wind it up until it breaks, and determine how many, uh, how many turns and also torque before it breaks. Then you can divide by the length of the uh, rubber motor to get turns by uh, turns per centimeter or turns by inch measure a full two gram loop of rubber now you can multiply and get your estimated maximum turns the maximum torque stays the same regardless of the length is only down to the cross section of the rubber generally a full revolution on this corresponds to one inch ounce of torque which is more than you should be needing unless you're flying guru airplanes that we don't talk about lubricating the rubber motor after every flight or before every flight keeping it clean etc uh, we've talked about needing lots of rubber motors now in all of this you need to keep records of your flight behavior so you need there's a data sheet that you can uh, download that also comes with our kits that shows all of that information there are other more detailed ones out there so that's what I've got is really the minimum number of information amount of information you should be recording you should be recording well, maximum turns for that winding back off to whatever your launch uh, turns and torque is and so on you should re be recording how high the airplane climbs approximately for that combination you should be recording um, how many times that rubber motor has been wound uh, circle diameter uh, climb altitude etc so the tighter you circle the airplane the more torque it's going to need to climb and so on uh, so look at all of that information, be familiar with what the requirements are for competition. So all of this is meaningless if you get tiered for not having a cover sheet or whatever. I, don't, I can't remember if they require a cover sheet. Yes, now, they do. Okay, so if you don't have your cover sheet, you get tiered for that. If you don't have complete flight logs, you get penalized for that. If you don't have a colored uh, wingtip or something, uh, uh, you, you, get, get you get lose your bonus, which means a 10% penalty, really, uh, if you don't have complete, uh, we talked about complete flight logs, the three view or dimensional, not the perspective drawing or whatever it's called, of the airplane, where you label fuselage, wing, tail, etc. You can simply take the document uh, from the kit that we supply or most of your other kit manufacturers and just draw lines and label those parts that satisfies that requirement that's all you have to do but you have to do it also if you don't label 
what school, what team you are from, your plane will get tiered. That is very important. Just writing that number on there. Okay, any further details um, that, uh, that some of you don't, don't understand or want clarified or th other things you'd like to see, post them in the comments section below. You can contact me through the website for more information as well. We also have much more detailed information on satisfying all of these requirements um, through the Indoor Flight University curriculum. So we have videos like this that go into much more detail, that go into some of the theory, that go into winding technique to a much greater extent, and so on. So check that out. Uh, there's a basic and an advanced version. And so that's something very useful in the classroom and so on. So we'll see you at, uh, at the contests and hopefully some of you at the Sayali Nats. Hi, I'm Josh Finn. This is Hope. We are J&H Aerospace. If you like this video, hit the like button. Also, how about subscribe to our channel and check out jhaerospace.com for new free flight products and all of the tooling that you'll need to build them. Thanks for watching.